This is uh, Jim Fetzer, your host on The Real Deal, with my very special guest today, a distinguished scholar, a leading international Islamic philosopher and author who specializes in world politics, economy, eschatology, modern socioeconomic and political issues, and is an expert on international affairs. He is the best-selling author of Jerusalem in the Quran. His name, Imran Nazar Hussein. I am so pleased to have you here on The Real Deal today. Thank you, Jim, for your kind invitation. I'm especially interested in your reflections on what's been taking place in the Middle East that has been in part described as a Arab Spring as uh, popular uprisings against dictators, as in the case of Egypt. But when we turn to Libya, something completely different appears to be taking place, where NATO, which was originally created as a collective defensive alliance against the possible invasion of Europe by this, the then Soviet Union, has been turned into an instrument of aggression against a, a regime that, so far as I can tell, was extremely benevolent toward his people. Could, could you contrast the cases of Egypt and Libya and, and other aspects of what's taking place in the Middle East today? Well, uh, as Muslims, we normally begin with a statement in Arabic, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. we begin in Allah's blessed name. Um, NATO is now showing itself to be a Zionist organization, um, and it is fulfilling uh, um, Zionist interests, pursuing Zionist goals. Um, that is becoming very clear now. Um, the Arab Spring germinated from seeds that were planted long, long ago. And uh, the best way for us to look at the subject is from a historical perspective. Um, history is not moving randomly, aimlessly towards uh, nowhere. History is moving towards a particular goal and we must be able to read history and to understand the direction of movement of history and the end to which it is moving. And uh, the study of the Middle East will begin way back with the Crusades. Why did a European Christian people have an obsession with liberating the Holy Land? And no other Christian people had that obsession. And they pursued that obsession for a thousand years until eventually we now having an Arab Spring which will bring to power so-called Islamic governments with the appearance that Islam is re-emerging now as a force in, uh, in the politics of the region. Um, and the Muslims are going to be feeling very nice about winning elections in, uh, they've, they've just done in Tunisia. The Islamic party has just come out with the largest number of votes in Tunisia. And we can close our eyes and know that this is the same thing that's going to happen in Egypt next month. And then the rest of the Arab world. Um, and Libya is now celebrating because in Libya, they are proclaiming, proclaiming, proclaiming themselves to be uh, the party of Islam. Um, so there is one common thread between them all, even though there are differences that in some cases it's a, um, a peaceful uh, uprising, whereas in other cases uh, they need some help, so it becomes a violent insurrection. But there is a common trend, uh, Jim, and the common trend is that Islam appears to be re-emerging in the region as a political force. And I am of the opinion that this is not happening by accident. This is meant to facilitate the achievement of the ultimate Zionist agenda. 
It is meant to facilitate the achievement of the ultimate Zionist agenda. You are suggesting that Zionist interests underlie a lot of these events, and therefore I would infer that they are not bona fide indigenous movements. Perhaps you could elaborate so that I do not misunderstand your interpretation of what's taking place. There is a combination Jim, of internal factors and external. If you stop the rain from falling, eventually the land will become parched and with just one little mad stick you can start a fire that will burn down thousands and thousands of acres. So what the Zionists did, using uh, the International Monetary Fund, for example, is one of their primary instruments, is to bring about a state of collapse of the economies in these countries uh, and impoverishment of the people, which is not by accident, but by design. And uh, not only do you have this economic poverty and destitution and intense suffering, because you are attacked economically and through monetary policies. But in addition to that, the Zionists propped up dictators who were savage against their own people. Hosni Mubarak was viciously savage in the way he treated the Egyptian people. They hated him. And so these people are suffering from both political and economic oppression. And they are longing for a day when the sun would shine. And the same people who inflicted the oppression upon them are the same ones who come, come along now and say, we can give you deliverance from oppression. The reason why they are doing it now, Jim, is so that they can claim tomorrow, in fact, tomorrow has already arrived in some places, that Islam now constitutes a threat, not only to Israel, but to the world. And since you've had more than 10 years of intense war on Islam in the media, and the people have been fed up to their throats with how evil Islam is, when you are now able to convince mankind that Islam now poses a threat, not only to Israel, but to the peace of the world, because of the rising tide of Islam in the Middle East, it would now provide Israel and provide the Zionist NATO organization with what we may call causes bellum, a justification for launching great wars against the Arabs, which will decimate the Arabs. Our Prophet, Allah's blessings be upon him, prophesied that this would happen. 1400 years ago. So, so it is your belief that this is a temporary stage, that the emergence of uh, Islamic rulers in these states is in a way setting things up for both the demonization of Islam uh, but also for future attacks upon those states that are under uh, uh, theocratic governments that are dedicated to Islam, uh, where, and this is in a, a secondary but very broad question, it has seemed to me that of the three Abrahamic religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, that Islam has the greatest claim to be a peaceable uh, religion that has the least reason to be aggressive or uh, to despair others who hold different beliefs, much less to take aggressive actions against other nations. Aggression is the trademark of Zionism. But they are also 
people with PhDs in deception. Israel has already planned her wars. Israel has a goal to achieve. And that's where we turn to eschatology, the study of the end times. We believe that history is not endless. History is not meandering. History is moving towards an end. That's the religious view. And uh, there is a common <laughs> belief, both the Jews and the Christians and also the Muslims, all three believe that history is moving towards an end, a culmination, which takes place in the Holy Land. In the Christian view, it is the return of the Son of Mary, the true Messiah, Jesus. In the Jewish view, it is the return, or not the return rather, the advent of the true Messiah because they rejected Jesus. And so they are waiting for a Messiah who is to come, divinely promised, who would rule the world from Jerusalem. And when Jesus returns, he also will rule the world from Jerusalem, according to the Christian view. And the Muslim view is exactly the same, that when Jesus returns, he's going to rule the world from Jerusalem. But our eschatology is similar to that of the Christians, that we believe that prior to the return of Jesus, by divine design, divine design, an actor is created who will impersonate the true Messiah. But he is not the true Messiah, he is an evil being. And this is where politics has to now reach out to cosmopology, cos cosmology. Hmm? The Antichrist or the Jal, the false Messiah. In order for him to rule the world and then declare from Jerusalem, I am the Messiah, when he would not be the Messiah, he has to do a number of things. Number one, he has to liberate the Holy Land for the Jews. He's already done that. 1917. Number two, he's got to bring the Jews back to the Holy Land to reclaim it as their own. He's already done that between 1917 and 1948. Number three, he has to restore a state of Israel in the Holy Land and get the Jews and Christians to believe that this is Holy Israel. He's already done that. If he was created in 48. Number four, he's got to get that state of Israel to become the ruling state in the world. Israel is already ruling the world from behind the curtain. Every American politician knows that. You don't step on Israel's toes at all if you want to survive in politics. Israel controls the U.S. Congress. Ariel Sharon said that. Nobody disputed it with him. In order for Israel to become the ruling state in the world, it has to replace the United States. Fifteen years ago, Jim, as a result of my study of Islamic eschatology, I'm not a prophet, I don't have any angel talking to me or any uh, invisible beings talking to me. It's plain analysis. Fifteen years ago, as a result of my study of Islamic eschatology, I came to the conclusion that the U.S. dollar will have to collapse, must collapse. And when the U.S. dollar collapses, it's going to bring down the whole American economy and going to bring down the whole world of paper currencies. And 15 years ago, I came to the conclusion that electronic money will take over from paper money. That's already happening now. From the time the next war starts, the next big war starts, I believe that's going to be the opportune moment for them to bring down the curtain on the U.S. dollar. And they'll demonetize the U.S. dollar. And that's going to cause tremendous loss, particularly for white America. Because white America is more wealthy than black America. Everybody knows that. 
No, no, not only must there be this economic collapse in the United States in order that the United States may no longer be the ruling state in the world, but you must also have a military disaster because this is what happened when Britain was the prior ruling state. In order, in order for Britain to be replaced by the United States, Britain had to be brought to the verge of defeat and that's what happened in the First World War. And again, in the Second World War, had it not been for the intervention of the United States, Britain would have been defeated. Similarly, we are looking to us tomorrow when the United States is going to be placed into a military situation which will be facing defeat. And if Israel does not intervene, Israel, the United States will be gone, militarily. So history will repeat itself. I don't know what that is going to be. I don't know. It could possibly be that an attack on Iran takes place and Iran is then provoked to take over Bahrain, which is largely Shia, and Iranian forces are moving towards Saudi Arabia. And the United States is forced to intervene in the desert there. And because the United States is already so military stretched out, they're going to be facing a difficult situation in the desert. And unless Israel intervenes, the United States might face defeat in the desert. This is one possible scenario. I don't know whether this could take place. But the United States will have to give way to Israel. Israel takes over from the United States as the next ruling state in the world in order for the Antichrist to stand up in Jerusalem and declare that I am the Messiah. Now, in order for Israel, I'm sorry for this long answer, in order for Israel... No, I appreciate it. In order for Israel to convince the Jews that it is indeed ruling the world, it has to begin that process, Jim, by establishing, establishing its political and economic dominion over the Arabs. And so what we are seeing now is the, the preparatory phase for the slaughter of the Arabs. As the rising tide of Islam emerges with elections taking place all around and Islamic parties winning and they are congratulating themselves that we are coming out of bondage and we are now free once again, they are actually being prepared for the slaughter. That's, that's a truly fascinating analysis, Imran, and it seems to me there are many very plausible aspects to everything you are saying. I am rather struck uh, that from the point of view of eschatology that the ultimate end from the perspective of all three religions is a form of benevolent dictatorship. It's ironic that so much that has been done in the Middle East and elsewhere, especially by the United States in its acts of aggression around the world, has been done in the name of democracy and freedom. And yet, the end of history from the perspective you have just described would actually be uh, a divine individual, presumably, but never and a benevolent one, but nevertheless a dictator, which someone who has uh, all power to control political decisions and outcomes, uh, which uh, seems to me to be quite remarkable, uh, while uh, students of political theory have generally concurred that a benevolent dictatorship is the most efficient uh, form of government uh, in distributing uh, justice, for example, assuming that the dictatorship is Im implemented in accordance with principles of justice. Uh, it's still striking to me, having not reflected before on the convergence of the theologies of the three great religions, that this should be the case. Well, I would not say it's going to be a benevolent dictatorship. 
the Antichrist is full of deception. Appearance and reality would be different from each other. It would be, in fact, the ultimate dictatorship. The ultimate dictatorship. It would have the appearance of being benevolent. You had Pax Britannica uh, when, when we were just children, you and I. Uh, I was born in 1942. So when I was a boy, we had to sing God Save the King because Britain ruled over the Caribbean island of Trinidad. So you had Pax Britannica appeared to the world to be benevolent, whereas Pax Britannica set the stage for the occupation of lands all over the world, the um, transformation of these territories from from governments and from peoples who worship the one God into secular states. And so the rule of law which came from the divine law, where for example you, you had um, a market which is free and fair and that if you stole you, they cut off your hands. Not of course a mango, but if you stole something of value your hand would be cut off. And so when before the European occupation of these territories, European colonialism, we had systems, political systems and economic systems which were indigenous to us and which worked better than one which was imposed upon us with Pax Britannica, the secularization of the economy the removal of gold and silver coins as money, the replacement of gold and silver coins with this bogus and absolutely and utterly fraudulent paper currencies. Hmm? Um, this was not something benevolent. This was something evil. And then you had Pax Britannica gave way to Pax Americana. And with Pax Americana, the world experienced something even worse than what we had in Britain. And so when Pax Judaica takes over from Pax Britannica, up giving the appearance that this is the ultimate benevolent, benevolent dictatorship, this is the best that you can ever have, it will in fact be the worst. I think that Israel is now going to move, move from the, the current secular political system to a monarchy. Uh, because ancient Israel had a monarch with King David and King Solomon. And when Israel becomes a monarchy tomorrow, Israel is going to bring back gold and silver coins as money. Oh yes, I think Ron, Ron Paul is going to be very pleased with that. When Israel, Israel has to bring back gold and silver coins as money, why? Because the temple in Jerusalem minted its own coins. The temple minted its own gold and silver coins and you had to go to the temple and use temple money, that was kosher money, to do transactions. And so no Jew would accept Israel to be holy Israel tomorrow if Israel continues to use this bogus and fraudulent paper currency that came out of the international monetary system. Tomorrow when Israel brings back gold and silver coins as money, across all the rest of Europe will follow suit. The appearance will be that this is something positive, that Israel is actually bringing order to a disordered world, and Israel can bring peace to a world full of war. But Jim, this is actually going to be the ultimate dictatorship, the worst that the world has ever experienced. It's coming tomorrow. Imran, this is absolutely fascinating. We have to take a break. This is Jim Fetzer, your host on The Real Deal, with my very special guest today, Imran Hossein, a leading international Islamic philosopher. This is uh, Jim Fetzer, your host on The Real Deal, continuing my conversation with Imran Hossein, who was born in the Caribbean island of Trinidad in 1942. He has lived in New York for 10 years. He served as the Director of Islamic Studies for the Joint Committee of Muslim Organizations of Greater New York. He has lectured widely 
around the world, and I am simply delighted to have him here with me today. Imran, let me ask, when we talk about uh, monarchies and dictatorships, we're talking about a rule of of men uh, or of leaders rather than a rule of law. And in addition, I'm concerned about the relationship between uh, you know, r- r- rulings by religious authorities in relation to principles of morality. It would be uh, my contention that a systematic evaluation of alternative moral theories leads to the conclusion that the most fundamental principle of morality can be found in the second formulation of the categorical imperative enunciated by Immanuel Kant to wit that we should always treat other persons as ends and never merely as means which entails showing respect for others and in relationship to the imposition of punishments, providing them with due process, some opportunities to confront their accusers, present evidence against uh, against their charges being brought against them, and so forth. There are certainly principles found in the Bible, uh, the Old Testament, for example, that seem to contravene such principles uh, of treating persons with uh, respect, in, 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 including, among others, that uh, mediums or spiritualists should be put to death, that uh, persons who have been guilty of adultery should be put to death, that children who curse their parents should be not given time out, not sent to their rooms, not deprived of television for a week, but put to death. I am very interested in your views about how to reconcile principles of morality, uh, uh, of due process and justice with the kind of rule being contemplated here, Uh, unless, of course, since we're talking about uh, a dictatorship uh, by an antichrist or Christ, where I'm fascinated by your remarks about all of this, it may be that such questions, simply from a theological perspective, no longer have significance. Well, insofar as the... uh Christian religion is concerned, I think it will be proper for a Christian theologian to respond to you about what is to be found in the Christian scriptures. Uh, Similarly with the Jewish scriptures, the Old Testament or the Torah. And I should restrict myself to explaining and defending the law which is to be found in the Quran. Um, That law, it is the belief of all Muslims, has come from the one God who created us from a drop of sperm. The Quran has a claim to authenticity that it could not have come from any human source. That it is in fact divinely revealed. No human being could have produced this book. And there's ample evidence to support it. The problem with the secular mind is it does not want to take up that challenge. Secularism (laughs) wants that all the battles must be fought here in this world and we must not ever step out of this dimension of work space and time. But we are a people who believe in a transcendental world and the Quran came from that transcendental world. And if people choose not to believe in us, not to share with us that belief, that's up to them. That's not going to change our views. And so once something is found in the Quran, whether we understand it or we don't, whether we are comfortable with it or we are not, once we recognize that it is the word of God, 
the uncorrupted, authentic word of God, the unchallengeable word of God, we submit to it. And we apply that law. That law does not say that the adulterer must be stoned to death. No. The Quran says that the adulterer and the adulteress must be punished with a public flogging. Whether people are comfortable with a public flogging or not is irrelevant. When they meet the Lord in the grave, they'll answer to him for their likes and dislikes. But this is our law. When we enforced our law, if you, if you look up State University of New York in Binghamton, they did research on the free and the fair market. And they found that the last free and fair market that mankind ever had was the market of the Ottoman Islamic Empire. You had market police in the market. You had magistrates in the market. And anyone who violated the law pertaining to the free and the fair market was tried in the market, the true, law, the true rule of law, and was punished in the market. For example, you had coins, you used coins, gold and silver coins. And if you went and chipped away at your coin to make it less in weight than it's supposed to be, or it was not a pure gold coin, there was some kind of an alloy, it was corrupted, and you were caught with those coins, and you were found to be guilty, you'd be punished in the market. Um, there were laws in place in the market which ensured that the market was a level playing field. That no one entered into the market as a privileged person. No. The market in the Muslim world did not favor the Muslim. No. If a Hindu entered in the market and the Hindu is a good businessman, the Hindu would prosper. And if the Muslim is not a good businessman, he would not prosper. And so we, with our religious law, when applied to the market, we gave to the world for the last time what is a free and a fair market. That free and fair market has disappeared today. If a, if a mathematician teaching mathematics in Bangladesh and at the end of the month he'll get a salary with which he can perhaps be able to buy a sheep. That's all. And all he has to do is to get on an aeroplane and fly to Washington. And he's teaching the same subject. Nothing, nothing different. The same textbook. Everything the same. But at the end of the month he gets a salary with which he can buy a hundred sheep. Something is wrong there. This is not a fair and free world market anymore, where one part of the world is imprisoned in permanent poverty, and the rest of the world, the other part of the world, is constantly growing wealthy and wealthier, where wealth no longer circulates through the economy. This is a sick economy. And so... To say that the religious law is in some way a violation of principles of fair play and the rule of law and so on, I think you need to study the subject more before we can make such a statement about the religious law. Well, let me ask you, Imran, how would we know that a, an open and, <coughs> and fair market such as occurred during the Ottoman Empire, but not since, and I completely agree that the principles laid down by Adam Smith for the operation of fair markets have long since been lost and obliterated by the practices of capitalism in the United States especially, but also elsewhere around the world. Uh, how do we know that those principles are the right principles from the perspective of you know, 
what perspective is is supposed to prevail to determine for us that those are the right principles i agree completely that corporate welfare and and cronyism and the frauds that have been perpetrated by the bankers and the the financial institutions in the united states have been completely corrupt that the recent decision by Bank of America to transfer $75 trillion of risky derivative transactions uh, from one side of the ledger to the other and, and burden the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, meaning the American taxpayers, with, with, with a liability thereof, which has been followed by J.P. Morgan, transferring $79 trillion of its own indebtedness to that side of the ledger as well, represent grotesquely immoral practices that are grossly unfair and reflect the power of the wealthy to act in their own interests, regardless of the consequences for others. But that is a conclusion I would justify on the basis of the principle of morality I previously enunciated, to wit, never treating other persons merely as means, which is clearly being abrogated here by Bank of America and J.P. Morgan. And I'm simply interested in how, you know, for me as a student of the theory of knowledge and of the philosophy of science who finds that we cannot prove the existence of God nor can we prove the non-existence of God because the course of history no matter what it might reveal could be claimed to be consistent with the will of God or not and therefore appears to be beyond uh, empirical or scientific determination which of course is generally recognized and acknowledged by philosophers of religion and theologians which is of uh, in turn the reason why belief in God whether it's the God of Judaism or the God of Christianity or the God of Islam is an article of faith but if I as uh, an empirically minded uh, philosopher uh, want to believe all and only those things that can be established on the basis of the scientific uh, or other empirical research, uh, unless, of course, they can be independently established on the basis of, of logic and language alone, uh, I am very concerned and interested to know how we can measure the moral rightness or wrongness of religious tenets, which have, after all, included acts recorded in the Old Testament, for example, uh, uh, of God demanding the sacrifice of children, of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, and similar events, which might be viewed by some as immoral or at least on the face of it somehow not treating other persons uh, with respect which seems to me to raise the possibility the specter you might describe it of a conflict between principles of morality that can be independently established on the basis of objective criteria as I have sought to do and religious beliefs which are based upon articles of faith which appear not to be capable of objective justification. Jim, I don't think you are expecting me to defend the Bible, are you? No, I'm, I'm uh, expecting you to simply address the broader I issue cannot, of conflicts between principles of morality and, and uh, articles of religious belief. I, I, I don't think I have the competence to defend the Bible, which the Quran speaks of as a corrupted document. Uh, it's no longer what it was. It has been changed. Um, and the Quran speaks about one of the changes in the Bible, which should be of interest to you. 
that the Lord God had prohibited money being lent on interest. Um, and in the Quran, he says that usury or riba is not business. That Allah had made business halal or legal and had prohibited riba or usury. And usury is whether the rate of interest is big or small, is still usury or riba. Um, in that statement in the Quran uh, concerning economic justice now, um, when he says that this is not business, what the Quran means is that all transactions should take place in the market. All business transactions should take place in the market. And that a business transaction is one in which one must embrace risk and hence can either make a profit or suffer a loss. And since there is an actor, an external actor at work in the market, namely the Lord God, he can take from some, cause them to suffer loss, and he can give to others, and so he can distribute and redistribute wealth, so that wealth would circulate through the economy. One day for me, one day for you. And so the rich would not remain permanently rich, and nor would the poor remain permanently poor. That's a healthy economy. And that has disappeared today in the world. One of the reasons why that healthy economy has disappeared is because we no longer have a fair market. A fair market is one in which you cannot use money to increase over time. If money can increase over time, then the rich will rule the world. No. If you want to invest, you must bring your money in the market and engage in business transactions. The money lender does not want to do that. The money lender wants to immunize himself from loss. And in the event that you cannot repay him the loan, he has your pound of flesh. I mean, William Shakespeare was absolutely brilliant in in uh, what is called the um, uh, Shylock, um, what's the name? Yeah. Um, was the Merchant of, of Venice. Street, that's Merchant right. of Venice. Yes. Merchant of Venice. He was absolutely brilliant in that play. Um, today yeah. we have a world economy around the world where banking has taken over and money is being lent on interest. The money lender now rules the world. This has come yeah. from the secular world. In the world of Islam, we never had money being lent on interest. And as a consequence, we had an economy which was a healthy economy in which wealth was circulating through the economy. That sounds to me to be more in conformity with principles of justice than this one where the rich are now permanently rich and the poor are permanently poor. But our discussion today should not be on whether or not God exists <laughs> whether or not the Quran is the word of God, but rather focus on what is happening in the Middle East. And uh, I believe that this financial part, this economic part, that the Middle East was attacked, brutally attacked by the bankers through the monetary system and reduced to such biting poverty that it was though, as though rain had not fallen for years. And so when that young man in Tunisia uh, um, poured the kerosene on himself and caught himself, uh, committed suicide, it, it was like a single match in Los Angeles causing fire to, to take all the, the mountains, all uh, thousands of acres being burnt. And it spread all over the Arab world because the conditions were ripe for it. They had suffered for long enough. What we need to now prepare ourselves for is that elections are going to be taking place around the world, the Arab world, 
and we can close our eyes and expect that the so-called Islamic parties, they have to be so-called because they cannot be really Islam. Islam will not submit to the United Nations Charter. Islam will not submit to the supreme authority of the Security Council of the United Nations. Islam will not submit to the, to the articles of agreement of the International Monetary Fund which prohibits the use of money. I mean, you prohibits the use of money, gold as money. So these are all so-called Islamic movements that are taking, um, <coughs> winning elections now. And these so-called Islamic governments are going to be set up now, Egypt in particular. Because once you have the elections in Egypt and an Islamic government <laughs> comes to Egypt, naturally they have to support the Palestinians in Gaza. I Imran, I agree with most of what you say, and I certainly agree with your observations about economics, but my question is, of this order, how do we know that one economic arrangement is just and that another is unjust. How do we know? How can we tell okay. that the, 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 the rich ruling the world is wrong and that the rich should not be permanently rich and powerful and the poor permanently poor and powerless? Okay, well, values. Now we turn to moral philosophy and we're going to be leaving politics for a while. Um, where do values come from? There are secular values and they are most certainly not absolute. There's a secular value which is now emerging and tomorrow probably will take over the world uh, that there's absolutely nothing wrong with a man having marriage with another man. What justification can there be for you to object to the marriage of a man with another man? Okay? And if you object to it, you're, you're suffering from a disease called homophobia. A hundred years ago, two hundred years ago, nobody would have thought about this, that this would ever happen. And so secular values are transient. Secular values are constantly changing. They're not absolute. But in the world of religion, we say that values come from the Lord God. If values come from the Lord God, you've got to look at the scripture to see whether or not the scripture is indeed a scripture that stands up as uncorrupted. The Christian scriptures do not, cannot survive. I mean, uh, just look at that book written by uh, Richard Friedman, uh, the American scholar of the Bible. Richard Friedman wrote a classic entitled, Who Wrote the Bible? And if you read that book, <laughs> Richard Friedman provides you all the evidence you need to demonstrate that there were several writers at work in writing the Bible, the Old Testament and the New Testament. And so these scriptures cannot stand up the test of authenticity. What we are asking is, why don't you come to the Quran? Here is a book which proclaims that it is the uncorrupted word of God. It came into the world more than 1400 years ago. And it has survived for more than 1400 years with its text intact. There are no two different copies of the Quran. Every single copy of the Quran around the world is still the same. Every single letter is still the same. Nothing has changed in 1400 years. And the Quran itself says of itself that not only has this book come from the one God, but he has guaranteed its protection. That nothing can corrupt it. And when you look at the Quran, you'll see the Quran anticipating events which have only re occurred recently. For example, let me give you an example. This is the Quran and the world today. Uh, in the fifth chapter of the Quran, entitled Al-Ma'idah, I think the verse is number 51, there is a command, O oh, you who have faith in the one God, do not take the Jews and do not take the Christians as your friends and allies. 
That's the beginning of the verse. If you use the lazy man's methodology, the defective methodology, you study the verse in isolation by itself, stand alone, then you come to the wrong conclusion. That the Quran is speaking about all Jews and all Christians. But when you use the correct methodology of studying the book as a whole, you see that's nonsense. The Quran could not be speaking about all Jews and all Christians. No. It is speaking about some Jews and some Christians. Do not take them as your friends and allies. Who are they? The next word, the next words which appear, ba'aduhum awliya ubaad, meaning do not take such Jews and such Christians as your friends and allies who themselves become friends and allies of each other. The Quran is anticipating the the mysterious reconciliation that took place in modern times between European Jews and European Christians and as a consequence the emergence of the Judeo-Christian Zionist alliance. This is 1400 years ago and Allah then goes on to warn that if any of you Muslims turn to them with friendship and alliance as Husni, Husni Mubarak did and Parvez Musharraf in Pakistan did, and the King of Jordan has done. If you turn to them with friendship and alliance, Allah says you belong to them. You've lost your Islam. We no longer consider you to be a part of the world of Islam. And Allah does not provide guidance for people who are wicked. And that, therefore the design is alliance is going to be wicked in conduct. This is the Quran 1400 years ago. Zionism only came to the world recently. So there are many things in the Quran which demonstrate that it could not have come from a human source. If you study the Quran and you come to the conclusion that it could not have come from a human source, then you can accept its claim that it has come from the one God. And then once you accept its claim that it has come from the one God, you have to submit to it. When you submit to it, eventually you'll begin to understand that there's so much of similarity between Immanuel Kant's categorical imperative and moral philosophy in the Quran. I am the student of a teacher who specialized in Immanuel Kant and who was an Islamic moral philosopher. And he considered Immanuel Kant to be one of the greatest philosophers of all times. I hope I'm not taking too much of your time. No, 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 I quite agree. I regard uh, Aristotle, Immanuel Kant, and Charles Sanders Peirce as the three greatest philosophers of all time. And I do agree that the principles of the Koran bear a strong affinity to the categorical imperative in its second formulation, and that the, the uh, doctrine of the... Uh, New Testament of doing unto others as you would have them do unto you uh, bears a similar striking affinity. And the question I would raise is that even if we do assume that the Koran is uh, a single document with the same words in the same order, uh, th through all versions and could be traced back, to the Prophet Muhammad, uh, are we not still left with the question of number one, ha what is the proper interpretation of the Quran, where I am given to understand that there are, in fact, multiple competing interpretations, and number two, perhaps even more important, what would there be about the Quran, given that it's written in, in words, in, in a certain sequence, that would require that it not have originated from the hand of man, but must of necessity be derivative of God? But there is a challenge in the Quran. God Almighty has said in the Quran, if you have doubt concerning the divine origin of this Quran, then why don't you produce a chapter that can match any of the chapters of this book? And uh, God Almighty goes on to say that you can seek help from all of mankind. All of mankind can come together, but they will not be able to produce a chapter 
And some of the chapters of the Quran as short as only three verses. And it's been 1400 years now, the challenge has been given. Uh, but, Jim, this, this discussion for us is now, time is running out. We are not so much concerned anymore with debating whether or not God exists. That time is gone now. We are concerned about tomorrow Israel taking over from the United States and Pax Judaica replacing Pax Americana and uh, the economic slavery that is now around the corner being imposed upon us. And what must we do? Because electronic money will take over from paper money tomorrow. I mean, no more paper currencies. And once electronic money takes over, you can't take your money out of any bank. You have the most ingenious system of espionage ever. That even you buy a newspaper, they will know where you are, they'll know how much you spent, they'll know how much you have in your account. And they can freeze your card any time they want. Argentina, a couple of years ago, froze every single bank account in that country for one month. And got away with it. What must we do? I think there are people in the United States who are waking up to what we've already woken up to. So what we need to do, Jim, is to, is to retreat to the countryside because we cannot succeed in the cities. Retreat to the countryside, the American countryside and build micro markets and prevent the use of the bogus money in the micro markets and use only real money. Ron Paul has been one of the most eloquent and powerful voices in the United States asking for the return to real money. He wrote to the Treasury Department and asked the Treasury Department how could the United States accede to the International Monetary Fund's Articles of Agreement which prohibit the use of money, sorry, which prohibit the use of gold as money. When everyone knows that whenever you have runaway inflation, it is gold that can solve the problem. Ron Paul cannot get an answer from them. The reason why they can't answer him is because they know that they're doing this in order to impose the slavery upon mankind, financial and economic slavery upon mankind. So our focus today is not so much upon convincing others that the Qur'an is the word of God. Our focus more is on how to survive the awesome predicament of this moment when Israel is about to take over from the United States and impose the ultimate dictatorship of mankind. That is what we are focusing, focusing upon. Imran, I could not agree with you more, and I am in admiration of your knowledge and even wisdom, my concern, your concern is one I share, would you believe that Ron Paul, in spite of his prominence as a Republican candidate for the presidential nomination, in spite of his having a string of successes in straw vote polls, uh, in California, in the the, the Value Voters Summit, uh, in b p political conservative uh, caucuses, in spite of prevailing in terms of the reaction to who has uh, done the best in re in the Republican presidential debates, where he has been the runaway winner time after time after time. The amount of press coverage devoted to Ron Paul in the United States on, in television and newspapers is minuscule. The, the media goes out of its way to suppress information about him. If, if some, if he comes in first, they'll talk about the person who came in second, as was the case at the Value Voters Summit where Herman Cain finished second, and, and even the one who, Anthony Perkins, the, who founded the Conservative Family Research Council, argued that the real significance of the poll was Herman Cain's finishing second, 
uh, and and not Ron Paul's finishing first. It is one of the most revealing displays of the manipulation of the mass media in the United States by the vested interests that I have ever seen in my lifetime, apart from suppression of what we have discovered about 9-11 and the the completely fabricated story of those events that has been embraced by the government and the mass media, where Ron Paul appears to represent (coughs) such a threat, such a stunning threat, because he wants to end these wars abroad, bring our troops home, stop uh, stop uh, foreign aid, uh, including clearly support for Israel. He wants to end corporate welfare. He wants to uh, restore civil liberties. There's a, a, an imposing list here of right actions that Ron Paul would take, where he alone Imran is willing to speak out about these issues, and no one else on either side of the aisle is willing to address them. It's a a stunning phenomenon for those who are paying attention that reflects the massive extent to which we live in a society that is controlled and manipulated where information is not free and where the the rare opportunities that the public has to learn what's really going on turns out to be from sources like the internet and talk radio which are among the only bastions left of free speech even here in the United States the situation is tragic and appalling and I commend you for everything you've said about Ron Paul which seems to me to be completely right and where the media's failure to provide the American people and indeed the world with accurate information is completely wrong but my view is to in order to escape from this vicious grip my solution is to withdraw to the countryside Mao Zedong did that and he succeeded he went to the countryside and he mobilized the countryside the further you are from the city the more would you escape from the clutches of the media the further you are from the city the better your chances from of escaping escaping from the economic slavery and political slavery you have more freedom the further you are from the city and so my suggestion is to withdraw to the countryside and build micro communities in the countryside small communities the smaller they are the more would the zionists have headache the Zionist wants all of us to, to congregate in the big cities, the mega cities. It becomes easier for him to control us there. And if we fan out into the countryside and we build communities in the countryside which can escape his media and escape his money, and we use real money in the countryside, we can restore our freedom, restore our capacity to think clearly and think properly and get out of the brainwashing and rebuild power and strength to take back our countries that's my that's my suggestion i wish i could say i thought there was any prospect that that could happen here in the united states uh the uh, b- b- property uh, is so tightly controlled and the American people I think have very much lost their capacity to cope for themselves in a rural environment uh, they are so dependent upon modern transportation and modern technology and the convenience of the supermarket as a single illustration that I think the 
the, the, the likelihood, the probability such a thing could take place here is extremely remote. Not that you are wrong in principle. Not that, that Mao didn't have an appropriate solution for the conditions that then prevailed in China. But those are completely different than what is uh, the situation here in the United States. And therefore, I'm very apprehensive that that solution is most unlikely to work here even though I would agree that there are many points to recommend it, among which you have enumerated quite a few. Our prophet has said about this age and about this predicaments of this age, these are his words. He said, if you have land, hold on to your land. And if you have animals, Hold on to your animals. And then someone asked him, O Messenger of Allah, what if we have neither land nor animals? He said, sharpen your sword. Sharpen your sword. (laughs) And so land and animals will allow you to survive. You will have food. But of course, land and animals means water. Water. And I am getting reports of Americans going to the countryside, homeschooling their children, and getting out of the clutches of the cities. I'm getting reports about that. Well, I think that's remarkable. I have not received those same reports, but uh, assuming they are accurate, that's very a very good sign. And of course... I have become a very strong proponent of the Second Amendment of the right to keep and bear arms, uh, not because I think it's necessarily going to maintain civil relations between, say, family households that may have disputes or rivalries or feuds, but because the American people, among others, need to have the capacity to withstand assaults by their own government so that I believe the fact that 80, 80, there are 80 million armed Americans in this country may be the single most important fact of the matter that enables us to preserve any semblance of freedom against the encroaching power of a, a police or neo-fascist state where corporations appear to be dominating every aspect of our lives including what we can or cannot hear in what is so often described as the free press or on radio and television. It's an appalling situation that I, who was born two years before you in 1940, never expected to take place during my lifetime, Imran. And to me, it is a great tragedy that my grandchildren, for example, are most unlikely to be able to enjoy the benefits of a free society that when I was a youngster, we could take for granted. And even in growing up, it's a tragedy that we have come to this point. I believe you have made many penetrating and astute observations about the Middle East and something to me that symbolizes perhaps as much as anything, the the horrific state into which world affairs has sunk has been the assault by NATO on Libya, where from everything I can piece together, Muammar Gaddafi was extremely generous with the Libyan people. He provided a national health care system. He provided public education. He guaranteed the uh, ability to go to college. He gave couples uh, $50,000 when they married. They were beneficiaries of additional support when they had children. He promised every Libyan a house before he provided one to his own father and he kept his promise. He established a national bank that wasn't indebted to the international banking cartel. He evaded the entrapments of the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. He was building an enormous 
a waterworks project that was going to turn North Africa green. He provided the highest standard of living for the Libyan people in all of Africa. He had detached his oil supplies from the petrodollar to the petro euro, which of course was also the offense committed by Saddam Hussein and by Iran, which are among the most important real reasons that they have been made targets of American aggression for the at the behest of the international banking system and the great international corporations. It's a tragedy, it seems to me that the North Atlantic Treaty Organization should have been turned into an instrument aggression and killed tens of thousands of Libyans, bombed their infrastructure, and perpetrated other uh, acts that are inhumane and uh, violations of international conventions for the ethical conduct of warfare that we have sunk so low. Imran gives me, causes me great despair and disillusionment where I can no longer say that I believe in my country. I believe in the principles for which my country is supposed to stand, but the actions that it has taken in a seemingly endless series of aggressive acts toward other states, including in Chile, in Ecuador, in, in El Salvador, in Nicaragua, in Vietnam, in Laos, in Cambodia, in Iraq, in Afghanistan, in Libya, and, and potentially in both Pakistan and Iran, to me, is a travesty and betrayal of everything for which this once great nation is supposed to stand. And it, 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 it shames me as an American and a former uh, commissioned officer in the Marine Corps the, 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 not to mention one dedicated to the best interests of his nation and the world that we should have come to this sorry state of affairs. Perhaps you would recognize, Jim, that in the same way that when the United States replaced Britain as the ruling state of the world, Britain became the puppy dog of the United States. When Nelson Mandela commented before the first Bush invaded Iraq, he said that the British Prime Minister was acting like the Foreign Minister of the United States. What we are now about to see, Jim, is a repetition. History is going to repeat itself. That in the same way that Britain became a puppy dog of the United States, so too the United States is now moving to becoming a puppy dog of Israel. There is, however, a silver lining. I think it's time for mankind to recognize that there is one force still remaining in the world which is standing up to Israel, standing up to world Zionism, standing up to that injustice in the world and oppression in the world. And that is true Islam. I'm not talking about Parvez Musharraf's Islam and Hosni Mubarak's Islam. I'm talking about those who are the true followers of the Prophet. And they're the ones who are fighting in Afghanistan fighting against occupation, fighting against oppression, and struggling for liberation from oppression. Tomorrow, I believe, uh, Jim, the consequences of what happened in Libya uh, are going to impact upon Turkey. Uh, the Turkish Prime Minister has become very popular in the Muslim world for standing up to Israel when the flotilla went to Gaza and he condemned Israel. The Turkish Prime Minister has become so popular now that he is being recognized as a second Saladin, Salahuddin Ayubi, Saladin. 
But Turkey is still a member state of NATO. And the events that we are now anticipating, Jim, is that what happened in Libya is going to provoke eventually civil war in Turkey. As soon as Israel launches the big wars and she attacks Pakistan's nuclear plants and nuclear weapons to destroy them, Iran. Pakistan is broken up. Hello? Did you mean Iran or Pakistan? No, no. Pakistan, because Pakistan has nuclear weapons. Yes. So those nuclear weapons have to be dismantled because they pose a threat to Israel. Perhaps they're already dismantled. But in addition to that, the nuclear plants must be destroyed so that Pakistan cannot produce nuclear weapons in the future. And Pakistan has to be broken up into different bits and pieces so that Pakistan can never re-emerge as a powerful state. So part, part of Pakistan becoming an independent Balochistan, part of Pakistan going to Afghanistan to make a greater Afghanistan, part of Pakistan going to India, etc., and only a rump remaining which will be under Indian hegemony. And then attack on Iran. Not so much to destroy the Iranian nuclear plants, but more importantly, to remove this regime, to bring about regime change in Iran, and to bring about an, a, a regime in Iran that will be more amenable to, to having close, closer ties with Israel. When these attacks take place, take place, there's going to be a profound impact on Turkey. And Turkish Muslims are going to question Turkey's membership in NATO. And as they question Turkish membership in NATO and they struggle to get NATO out of Turkey, that's going to be music in Putin's ears. Russia is going to be very pleased with that. But Russia needs to have access to the Mediterranean for the Russian Navy. And access to the Mediterranean from the Black Sea means passing through the Bosphorus. And so long as Istanbul or Constantinople remains a NATO city, Russia is boxed in into the, Bosphor into the Black Sea. Our prophet has spoken, is given a prophecy about an end time event, the conquest of Constantinople, which is linked with the return of Jesus. So it could not have been the conquest of Constantinople that took place hundreds of years ago, but rather a liberation of Constantinople from NATO, from NATO's control. And so there is a silver lining behind the attack on Libya and the assassination of Muammar Gaddafi and the emergence of the Zionist state of Libya. And that is that it is going to provoke a positive response now in Turkey. We just have to wait for that. Imran, I cannot thank you enough for the generosity you have shown with your time in appearing here with me. It is one of the most substantial and remarkable conversations it has been my pleasure to have with any of my guests. And I simply want to thank you profoundly for being here. I want to remind my audience that I have been speaking with Imran Hossein, a leading international Islamic philosopher, scholar, and author, where his specialization in world politics, economy, eschatology, and economic and political issues has been very apparent here. On behalf of myself, Imran, therefore I thank you for being my guest, and all of you out there for listening.
Allah fahabli tawbata wa ufir dhunubi fa innaka ghafiru dhambi al-azim ilahi lasdulil firdausi ahla wa la Allah faham li taubat wa ghafir dhunubi fa innaka ghafirul dhambi al-azim Tuhan ku aku tidak layak untuk syurga mu tetapi aku tidak pula sanggup menanggung siksa neraka Dari itu kurniakanlah ampunan kepadaku Ampunkanlah dosaku Sesungguhnya engkau lah pengampun dosa-dosa besar Tuhanku Tidak pula sanggup menanggung siksa nerakamu Dari itu kurniakanlah ampunan kepadaku Ampunkanlah dosaku Sesungguhnya engkau lah pengampun dosa-dosa besar Allah fahab li 